Tonight on KBBS Evening Edition, half of all registered voters in San Diego County can expect something special in the mail this week. Mail-in ballots are on the way to more than 750,000 voters. Tonight, we look at Proposition A on the June ballot. Exactly what is Prop A and why should you care? That's coming up. KPBS Evening Edition starts now. Hello, thanks for joining us. I'm Joanne Farian. I'm Dwayne Brown. The San Onofre nuclear power plant may not go back online as soon as its operators were hoping. The chairman of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission says there's no timetable to restart the plant, and a federal review of San Onofre's tubing problems will take as long as it takes. Officials with Southern California Edison were hoping to restart the plant in June. It's been shut down since late January when problems were found with the tubes that carry radioactive water in the plant's steam generators. The NRC says says it's premature to start talking about restarting the plant. A federal appeals court wants Congress or the president to overhaul mental health services for veterans. Today's decision reverses an order for dramatic changes in how the Veterans Administration provides services. Last year, the Ninth Circuit Court accused the VA of unchecked incompetence. It said it was taking weeks for a suicidal vet to get an appointment. The court ordered immediate help for those vets, but today, a larger panel of the same court said judges don't have the authority to change the system. Attorneys for veterans say they will take the case to the U.S. Supreme Court. An El Cajon woman who sold suicide kits will serve five years probation for failing to file federal tax returns. 92-year-old Charlotte Hydorn agreed to stop selling the kits. Prosecutors say Hydorn didn't know who was buying her products, and they say charging her with tax evasion was the best way to stop the sales. Hydorn says she started making the kits after her husband died in, uh, in a hospital so the terminally ill could die at home. In our ongoing election series, Follow the Money, we've been sharing with you the ins and outs of financing a political campaign. Today, we look at the kinds of donations candidates can accept other than cash from our media partner, Investigative News Source. Ryan Grohowski joins us from the News Center. What can you tell us, Ryan, about these non-cash contributions? There are a wide variety of examples, but basically anything that is of value must be reported publicly refreshments at a campaign event or the cost of the meeting place for the event itself are a couple examples. Another example would be forgiveness of a loan. If a candidate receives a campaign loan from a friend and that friend later forgives or reduces the amount owed, that needs to be reported. Are there any regulations governing the amounts of these contributions? Yes, and they are just like the regulations on monetary contributions. Individuals may not give a candidate anything worth more than $500 per election, and organizations are not allowed to contribute to candidates. And we talked in the past about candidates donating to their own campaigns. Can a candidate donate goods and services to his or her campaign? Yes, and uh, just like monetary donations, uh, that candidate can donate as many items to his campaign as he wants. It must be reported differently, though. If a candidate wants to donate office supplies to his campaign, for example, he can't just go out and buy pens and paper from his personal checking account and donate the supplies. He must put that money into his campaign account first and then buy the supplies from there. Then he can report the purchase. And are, any of the, are there any exceptions to these guidelines? Yes, volunteers who donate their time to help a candidate with no expectation of reimbursement would not be considered in the violation on the limit of donations. Ryan Grohowski with our media partner, Investigative News Source. You can keep following the money with Investigative News Source at kpbs.org. Recently, California's top financial official sent a warning to San Diego, passed Proposition A, and the city stands to lose millions of dollars. Joanne tells us what the measure is all about with her guests at the Evening Edition Roundtable.
Prop A is a city ballot measure that would end project labor agreements, or PLAs. PLAs are used in large construction projects to dictate the terms of work, including budgets and employee pay. Most of these agreements require workers to receive union-level wages, even if the contractor doesn't use union labor. State Controller John Chung says passing Prop A would make San Diego ineligible to receive state funds for construction. Last year, the city got $158 million dollars in those funds. Joining me are Eric Kristen, Executive Director for the Coalition for Fair Employment and Construction, and Donna Fry, former San Diego City Council member. Thank you both for being here. Thank you, Ryan. Eric, I want to toss it over to you first. Where do you stand on this proposition and why? Well, we brought this to the voters, similar to other initiatives that we brought in the region over the last couple of years. And actually, the citizens of San Diego have already voted. In 2010, November, they passed an initiative then that banned project labor agreements at the county level. Every precinct within the county voted in favor of banning project labor agreements. So this is actually the second go around for city voters. And we believe it's important to not only have greater transparency in government, one thing that we'll do with this initiative is that we will mandate and codify into our constitution, because we are a charter city, the fact that all contracts, construction-related contracts, have to be posted online, that the number of bidders has to be posted, and what their bids were. And that if a sole source, uh, uh, if a project is sole source, the mayor has to explain exactly why only one person was given that project. Secondly, what it does is it protects workers' rights. Project labor agreements, like they have at San Diego Unified School District, discriminate against workers by forcing them to pay into union health, welfare, and pension plans, and forces them to be hired through a union hiring hall, despite the fact that they're not in a union. We think that that's wrong and discriminatory, so we are strongly in favor of Prop A. I'm going to follow up on, on that point uh, later on, but first, Donna, why don't you like this proposition? Well, first of all, it's neither fair, it's not open, and it's not honest. They're just not being honest with you on what the effect will be on the taxpayers, and I think that's really important. First of all, just, just, to, just to begin, if Prop A passes, the upfront costs are going to be over half a million dollars. Then, in order to, to deal with this on an annual basis, the cost will be approximately four hundred and fifty thousand dollars on an annual basis that's for the why, why will it cost well that? because that, those are the costs to post the text of construction um, contracts online second the state controller has said that if the city votes to ban project labor agreements they will no longer be eligible for state funds and in 2011 as you pointed out it was 158 million but the year before that, it was about $36 million. So we're looking at almost $200 million that's at risk. But the other big problem with this ballot measure is that it's going to turn into a legal mess because we know that the Prop A proponents have been losing at court. So now they're trying to do an end run around the courts, and they are going to be challenging this. Guess who gets to pay for that legal challenge? The taxpayers. So, Donna, while you were a city council member, did the center, did the city enter into any of these project labor agreements? The city of San Diego has never been a party to any project labor agreement, which is why this is even goofier than 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 one can imagine. So, Eric, why why are you doing this now? Waiting for workers to be discriminated against is not really how we operate. We like to proactively protect workers' rights and taxpayers' dollars. We know that the unions, we've already seen it, have a project labor agreement designed for the new city hall that's been discussed, for the convention center expansion. They wanted one on the airport expansion. They got one at the San Diego Unified School District. So waiting for workers and taxpayers to be harmed is not our modus operandi. So we are proactively, as we have around the state in nine entities, and has 13 states as of this morning, with Oklahoma being the 13th state, we are banning project labor agreements and banning entities, in this case the City of San Diego, the City Council, from even having the opportunity to discriminate because we don't believe discrimination is I want to pick up on discrimination because people at home are saying this is really about wages. So this is an agreement that says if you enter into this, this work, if we give you this contract, you have to pay so much union wages. I think people at home would argue that that's not discrimination, that they get they, they, they likely will get paid more than if there isn't a PLA. So yeah, I, I'm not sure. Unfortunately, I'm it's not actually about wages at all. Wages on public uh, projects are actually mandated by the state and federal government. So workers are paid the same regardless of a project labor agreement. Where it is a factor about wages is how non-union workers have money stolen from them under a project labor agreement by being forced to pay into a union health, welfare, and pension plan by being forced under a project labor agreement to pay union dues like they have to do under the San Diego Unified School District PLA. So you're right. On the 
the one sense that workers who are non-union actually lose monies that would otherwise be going to them, and we want to protect them. It sounds like a sort of a, a union versus you know, non-union kind what, of well, political thing. Well, it actually is, and the fact of the matter is, is that Eric and his coalition are picking a fight, but they don't want to pay for it. They don't want to pay for the battle. So they want to, they want to use a, a smoke screen of accountability that's going to cost taxpayers $500,000 up front. Then it's going to cost them $450,000 annually. Then they want to put the taxpayer dollars at risk hundreds of millions of dollars in construction project funding from the state. They're willing to gamble with the taxpayer's money. And then if that's not enough of heaving the public under the bus, they want to go and have this battle and continue these court battles again on taxpayer funds and We're, let the taxpayers have to pay for their fights. If they I want to have the there fight, because have we're out of it. time and I want people uh, at home to know where they can get more information. So first of all, if you both give me websites of where they can go home and do some of their own research, Eric, uh, to get more info on this. Vote yes on Prop A. And Donna? And also no on Prop A. Okay, thank you both for being here. Thank, thank you. you. A judge still has to okay San Diego's plan to use a hotel room tax to pay for expanding the downtown convention center. But there's debate over another deal regarding the convention center. We'll look at that in just a moment. And the new book offers some hope to women who wait to start a family. We'll talk with the author, a professor from San Diego State, in just a moment. This is KPBS Evening Edition. Tonight on KPBS at 8, Antiques Roadshow is in Minneapolis at the American Swedish Institute to discuss Mora Clocks and to appraise a George Elmsley chair that could fetch $50,000. Then at 9, Antiques Roadshow Special Edition spotlights celebrities, big shots, and headliners through objects connected to their lives. And at 10, is the painting a real Monet? An art collector's painting goes under the microscope on fake or fortune. That's tonight on KPBS. In the last year, KPBS News has been honored with nearly three dozen awards. I'm extremely proud of these honors, and I thank you for your support as we continue to serve our local communities with award-winning news coverage in the years to come. I'm Jeffrey Brown. On the next News Hour, election news here and in Europe. That's Monday on the PBS News Hour. KPBS Evening Edition is made possible by Joan and Irwin Jacobs and by San Diego City Council voted to ask a judge today to decide if a funding proposal to expand the downtown convention center is legal, but it's another deal some say was struck to gain favor with hotel owners that has some folks upset. KPBS Metro reporter Katie Orr has the story. Pretty much anyone with any power in San Diego agrees that an expanded convention center would be a good thing for the city. But the project isn't cheap. The upfront cost is about $520 million, over a billion dollars with bond interest. City leaders feared a public vote on the project would fail, so they asked city hoteliers to raise room taxes to fund most of the expansion. The scheme was successful, and earlier this spring, San Diego Mayor Jerry Sanders announced the hoteliers overwhelmingly voted to go along with the plan. The vote's not only good news for hotel and visitor industries, it's better news for our economy. This expansion will create 11,000 jobs, 4,000 construction jobs, and 7,000 permanent jobs, generate millions of dollars in revenues for the city services, and pump nearly $700 million a year into our economy each year. But there are those who think it may be a better deal for some than for others. Why? Well, many of the hoteliers are part of the San Diego Convention and Visitors Bureau. And while hotel owners were voting on whether to increase their room taxes, the San Diego City Council voted to transfer a lucrative marketing and booking contract from the Public Convention Center Board over to the privately run Visitors Bureau. That means Convis will now book many of the conventions held at the center and can also set the center's prices. Councilman David Alvarez was the only council member to vote against the deal, which he says was done to secure the hoteliers' vote. Hotel 
owners, property owners, uh, were clearly stating that unless they received control of how we market and sell the convention center, uh, they were unwilling to support the tax that was promoted to create uh, the, the fund to expand the convention center. Alvarez says this was a hasty deal that had no business plan and no proof this is a good move for the city. Local labor unions agree. They worry that hoteliers will divert lucrative business away from the center, which generates public revenue, and into private hotels, which don't always employ union workers. I thought it was the most disgusting power grab that I've ever seen happen at City Hall. Bridget Browning is the president of the local hotel workers union. She calls the move a giveaway to hoteliers whose primary interest is making money for their own properties, not making sure the convention center is profitable. These hoteliers are not doing us a favor by supporting the expansion of the convention center. They are going to benefit from the convention center expansion one way or the other. And if we really believed that the citizens of San Diego had a value, not not just rich hotel owners, then we would be saying to them, okay, what is the community component? It's not just about these guys making more money. It's about all of us being more prosperous. While critics of the move call it a giveaway to hoteliers, supporters of the switch say it will streamline marketing operations and help get the expansion built. People keep saying it's a giveaway. I'm not sure what the giveaway is. It's a giveaway to 11,000 jobs. Stephen Cushman is special assistant to the mayor on the convention center expansion. He's been working on the project for three years and helped create the financing plan. It relies on $35 million a year from the increased hotel taxes and $3.5 million a year from San Diego for 30 years. The port is also kicking in $3 million a year for 20 years. Cushman says union fears that business will be diverted from the convention center are unfounded whether it's the Town & Country or the Manchester Hyatt or the Marriott, wherever it is, each hotel has its strengths and each has its weaknesses. But there is nothing like the San Diego Convention Center. Uh, there is no one that has a number of square feet. There's no one that can feed as many people. The new convention center is going to have an 80,000 square foot ballroom. There is no such thing like that in the city. Cushman admits that hoteliers wanted certain assurances they could book as many hotel room nights as possible and having more control of the center might give them those assurances. But he says the city council will get regular updates on how the deal is working. And this is not a totally new concept. Up until 2004, Convis actually had some control over the center's bookings. But the contract was taken away after questions were raised over how the Visitors Bureau was spending taxpayer money. Current Convis president and CEO Joe Terzi says the organization is more stable now. And he says having a profitable convention center is in everyone's interest. We don't expect to change the, the, the pricing. We don't expect to change a lot of the standards um, and and frankly we can't because if we do that and the revenue stream to support the building goes away then no one's going to be successful so we recognize there's an obligation. Terzi acknowledges that hoteliers will benefit from the deal but he says that means San Diego as a whole will benefit as well since tourism is such a big industry for the city. But whether this deal will actually lead to the expansion that most everybody would like to see is uncertain. A judge will be weighing in on whether the funding plan is legal, and that process could take more than a year. That was KPBS Metro reporter Katie Orr. You can find more on the Convention Center issue on our website, kpbs.org. Tonight, some new information regarding the age-old question, when is the right time to have a baby? A San Diego author breaks down some myths, and a doctor offers some advice over at the Evening Edition Roundtable. Some women are waiting longer to have babies these days. According to the Centers for Disease Control, one in five women are waiting until they're 35 or older to have their first child. Just how does waiting impact fertility? SDSU psychology professor and author Jean Twenge examined this question in her newest book, The Impatient Women's Guide to Getting Pregnant. Also joining me is Dr. Sanjay Agarwal, clinical professor and director of fertility services at UC San Diego. Thank you both for being here. Jean, why did you want to tackle this subject? Well, um, when I 
started trying to have my first child. We were, we were 34, so we were right at that, at that edge. And I started reading everything I could get my hands on. Um, but I'm a researcher, so I wanted to go back to the original source, the original medical journal articles. And I found a lot of really inter interesting information there about uh, fertility and age, that it wasn't actually as scary as you might have thought, and also just some great information uh, to try to get pregnant faster, some good tips on that. Started sharing those with my friends, and then thought, hey, I can reach even more people by writing a book on it. I want to talk about what you what you learned, but first of all, doctor. Now, according to the CDC, we have another stat here. It's tougher for a woman to get pregnant and stay pregnant after the age of 35. About one third of couples in which the woman is older than 35 will have fertility problems. What happens to women and fertility after 35? Well, women are born with all their eggs, and with time, that number goes down. And as the number of eggs goes down, their fertility goes down, and that's what eventually leads to menopause in the 50s. And I don't want you to make it sound like it's a, a cliff or it's a black and white situation. Fertility goes down gradually, and then from the mid-30s, 35, 36, 37, fertility goes down a bit quicker. So, Jean, in your book, there, there's an interesting sort of this list of myths, right, that, that right. you were busting. And, and you did say that the off-sided statistic that one-third of women over 35 will have fertility issues is based on birth records from the 1700s. Is that it is. true? It, it really is. Yeah. So if you go and trace back the origin of that statistic, it comes from a human reproduction article. It's a good journal. But, yeah, that's where the data come from. We don't have an, uh, enough good data on natural conception, so a lot of times the biggest studies are from historical birth records, but of course things are a little different now. We've got uh, modern medicine, people live a lot longer, they're, they're healthier, and that's not going to completely change uh, the fact that fertility goes down as women age. But more recent studies have found more optimistic statistics. They suggest more like 82% or so of women will be pregnant after a year, even if they're over 35. So really, doctor, the CDC stat that I threw out there, that's not a good number? It's a little high. I don't want to be too depressing for your population, <laughs> <laughs> but you know it really depends on you. If you succeed, you're in the 100% that succeeded. Mm -hmm. If you didn't succeed, you're in the 100% that didn't. So that's why we recommend six months of trying when you're over 35, 12 months if you're younger, so you don't spend too long before seeking help. Do you think that perhaps women are rushing to fertility specialists sooner than they need to? And I'm going to toss that out to both of you, and let's start with you, Jean. I think it does happen sometimes. Uh, I think sometimes they wait too long as well. You read uh, infertility blogs, and women will say, you know, I tried, we tried for three years before we saw a doctor, and I wish we had gotten help sooner. Yet there are some who maybe will try for three months and then, and then rush, to, rush to, to get treated for infertility, and that's probably too soon. So I think six months is a, is a great happy medium. It's common for us to tell patients to try a little longer, and when they have difficulty, a year for younger individuals, six months after 35, I think it's best for them to see their OBGYNs, their primary care physicians, because these people can also do a lot of investigations and basic treatments. Not everyone needs to see a reproductive endocrinologist. We know, though, there, there are going to be increased risks as you get older. Do you think that we're having the discussion that young women today or even not so young women are having this discussion that there could be perhaps some medical price or even, you know, real price to pay by delaying childbirth or delaying pregnancy, that we, there is this assumption that we can wait and wait and wait and wait and then just see a doctor? Well, I think, some, I think some people may have that, but most of the women who I interviewed for the book came down on the other side. They were very concerned about this, very much wanted to have children, were worried they had already waited too long and so on, and were really relieved to hear that, well, yes, it might take longer, your fertility does decline as you get older, but that doesn't mean you won't be able to get pregnant. What do you think, Doctor? Well, I think not everyone's in the right place to have a child earlier either. Exactly. And in terms of careers, relationships, you know. Um, undoubtedly, I think women feel the pressure greater than men do, and you need a couple usually, <laughs> so <laughs> that's not always the situation. So if they are in a stable relationship and having children is a part of that for them, then certainly from a medical standpoint, it makes sense to consider this earlier than ra later. Okay. Jean, where can people find out more about your book? Uh, well, I have a website, impatientwoman.com, and I'll also be signing books at Warwick's on Wednesday night at 7.30, so Warwick's Bookstore in La Jolla. Great. Thank you both for being here. Thank you. A San Diego editor's comments about the mayor's race are stirring up some debate. The story in a moment. This is KPBS Evening Edition.
next time on Doc Martin. I need to look after James. When Martin's in charge of the baby. Babysitting is not in my job description. He finds unexpected help. I would be more than happy to look after him for you, Doc. But things go very badly. Stop staring at my baby. Get your own. You gave our baby to Mrs. Tishel. And Doc must rely on his charm to save the day. Tell her you're a difficult person. Say it. Doc Martin. Watch the season finale of Doc Martin. Thursday at 9 on KPBS. Money dominates politics, and as a result, we have neither capitalism or democracy. You and I don't have a lobbyist, and so we are not represented. We have to all become activists. Let's talk about what we can do together for the nation. Join me on Warriors and Company. Join the conversation Friday night at 10, only on KPBS. Welcome back to the Public Square on KPBS Evening Edition. Tonight, a follow to a story on KPBS.org and KPBS Radio. Metro reporter Katie Orr reports on some comments UT San Diego editor Jeff Light made during an editorial board meeting with mayoral candidate Nathan Fletcher. A member of the Fletcher campaign recorded the 60-minute conversation and released it to the media. Orr says Light knew he was being recorded. During the meeting, Light said the UT board did not want to see Democratic Congressman and mayoral candidate Bob Filner make it to the general election. And over the weekend, the paper's editorial board also endorsed council member Carl DeMaio for mayor. Now, here are some of your comments. Robert Halverson writes on Facebook, I have no problem with the newspaper's editorial board endorsing a particular candidate, but most, no most newspapers do. However, I do have a problem with the head of the news department making biased comments, whether left-wing or right-wing. It shows bias in their reporting. And Robert Rolando Salinas writes on KPBS.org, How fitting the paper endorses DeMaio on Sunday, and today we hear the rest of the story. As a longtime reader of the paper, 36 years, along with many of my neighbors and friends, are canceling our subscription and boycotting the paper's advertisers. Well, you can listen to the entire one-hour conversation at kpbs.org, where you'll find Katie Orr's complete report. You can also add your two cents by following us on Twitter, liking us on Facebook, and, of course, you can always send me an email, jferian at kpbs.org. And now let's go back to the news desk where Dwayne has a recap of tonight's top stories. The head of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission says there's no timetable for restarting the San Onofre nuclear power plant. Last week, you may recall, operators said they were hoping for a June restart, but the NRC says the plant won't go online until it finishes its review of the steam generator tubes. And an El Cajon woman who sold suicide kits has been sentenced to five years probation for failing to file federal tax returns. Charlotte Heidorn also agreed to stop selling the kits, and prosecutors agreed not to charge her in connection with half a dozen suicides involving the kids. You can watch and comment on any of the stories you saw tonight on our website, kpbs.org slash evening edition. Thanks for joining us. Have a great night. We leave you with a look at the forecast. watching KPBS. The PBS NewsHour is made possible by the members of KPBS and our program underwriters. What makes someone a local hero? 
giving back, making a difference, or hard work. Tell us who your local hero is in the disabled community, and that person may be recognized by KPDS and Union Bank. Go to kpds.org slash heroes and nominate a San Diegan who's making a difference. Nominations are due by June 3rd. Cole's Fine Flooring, since 1947, a display of carpet, wood, tile, area rugs, room-sized carpet remnants, and custom window treatments. Cole's Fine Flooring, San Diego, San Marcos, El Cajon, Solana Beach, and the military exchanges. To live by the sea. Casa de Manana is a full-service retirement community just steps from the sea and blocks from the arts and culture of La Jolla Village. Casa de Manana, a front porch community. Europe faced a potential new direction today after voters in France and Greece rejected harsh austerity measures. Good evening, I'm Jeffrey Brown. And I'm Gwen Eiffel. On the News Hour tonight, we get the latest on the weekend's elections and what's at stake across the continent. Then we turn to the presidential contest here in the U.S. as Vice President Biden stirs new questions over the politics of same-sex marriage. Spencer Michaels reports on a trendy gourmet treat of the crunchy, crawly variety. These are the locusts. They're huge. They're usually super abundant, and they're very good to eat. I prefer them barbecued. And Margaret Warner examines the trial of five 9-11 suspects arraigned in a military courtroom on Saturday. That's all ahead on tonight's NewsHour. Major funding for the PBS NewsHour has been provided by... This is the AT&T Network, a living, breathing intelligence bringing people together to bring new ideas to life. Look, that's so simple. In here, the right minds from inside and outside the company come together to work on an idea, adding to it from the road, improving it in the cloud, all in real time. Good idea. It's the AT&T Network, providing new ways to work together so business works better. City turns 200 this year. In that time, there have been some good days and some difficult ones. But through it all, we've persevered, supporting some of the biggest ideas in modern history. So why should our anniversary matter to you? Because for 200 years, we've been helping ideas move from ambition to achievement. And the next great idea could be yours. by Nordic Naturals. And by the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, supporting science, technology, and improved economic performance and financial literacy in the 21st century. And with the ongoing support of these institutions and foundations. And... This program was made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. Two more European governments are gone, swept away by a wave of anti-austerity sentiment. The outcome of Sunday's elections raised the prospect today of major policy shifts on debt and economic recovery. A beaming Francois Hollande, the French president-elect, waved to reporters this morning from Socialist Party headquarters in Paris, having promised a new direction for France and Europe. The man he unseated, President Nicolas Sarkozy, had joined the German-led drive to implement fiscal austerity throughout the indebted nations of the European Union. Vive la République et vive la France! But Hollande's win directly challenged that effort, as he made clear in his victory speech last night. Finally, austerity could no longer be a fate. You are much more than a people who want change. You are already a part of a movement that is rising across all of Europe and maybe the world. German Chancellor Angela Merkel had taken the unusual step of publicly endorsing Sarkozy, which he congratulated Hollande today. 
Ich darf von meiner Seite aus sagen, dass ähm, François Hollande I can say that François Hollande will be welcomed by me with open arms here in Germany and we will conduct intensive discussions because Franco-German cooperation is essential for Europe. And as we all want success for Europe, this cooperation will begin very quickly. To that end, Hollande will visit Berlin shortly after his May 15th swearing in. He said he wants changes in a European Union treaty that limits national debt to allow for economic stimulus measures. But Merkel today maintained her determination to enforce belt tightening. We in Germany and I personally believe the fiscal pact is not up for negotiation. One of the principal targets of that fiscal pact is Greece, where voters yesterday sent an enraged message against austerity repudiating the approach of the government of Prime Minister Lucas Papademos. The Greek people made their choice. I believe that it is of great importance to maintain the stability, the confidence and the solidarity to conclude the effort to rectify the economy. Greece has received bailouts from the EU and the International Monetary Fund. A double-digit unemployment, tax increases and sweeping public spending